Good evening. Welcome to season three of OSDIA Facebook Live. Um, I'm Mark D'Annunzio calling in from Pensacola Beach. And first, I would like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day, and particularly two of our more notable Irish friends, John Quinn, who's the first gent. Uh, he's the husband of our national president, Nancy D. Fiore Quinn. So happy St. Patrick's Day, John. And Michelle Barrett Bianchi, who's the wife of our national first vice president, Bob Bianchi. Again, happy St. Patrick's Day. Oh, wow. So we have, a, we have an Italian American connection today. Um, I feel a little bit Irish. My father, my late father was born on St. Patrick's Day and his name was Louis Patrick D'Annunzio. So that's my little bit of Irish uh, attachment. And tonight we have on our Italian wine expert who is also Irish. Sharon McCarthy is a sommelier and the vice president of education for Banffy Wines. And she is, has a great affection for Italy and Italian wines. I saw her give a presentation on the American Wine Society during their convention. And she was extremely knowledgeable about Italian wines. And I was overwhelmed by her, by her affection for Italy and the number of times that she's visited. Also on the call tonight is our moderator, Jason Smith, calling in from Washington, DC, from our national office. And just, excuse me, Justin Smith. And Justin will be moderating. And if you have questions to ask for Sharon, just type them into your comment section. So welcome, Justin. Thank you for being on. Um, our other co-host, uh, Clarissa Burt, was having some technical problems, and hopefully she will be able to join us shortly. But uh, Clarissa uh, is also of Irish descent, but has an Italian has an Italian passport, and it is a citizen of Italy. And uh, she oversees a multimedia empire in the limelight which has a magazine and uh, also is social media streaming. So we hope to see her in a little bit, but let me, let's get started with, with Sharon. So Sharon, welcome. Thank you for, for being on the show tonight. Uh, as you said, the leprechauns are, are <laughs> pulling tricks on us today because you were having a little bit problem with your internet and fortunately you are back. And I don't know, the leprechaun jumped over to the other Irish girl, uh, to Clarissa and is now uh, providing problems for her. So first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how a nice Irish girl got to be an Italian wine aficionado and uh, so knowledgeable about, about Italian wines. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you all for inviting me. I am so excited to be here because while I may not be Italian by birth, I do feel I'm Italian in my heart. And it all starts with this property in the back of me, um, Castello Banfi, which is located in Tuscany. We're in the southwestern corner of Tuscany. I started uh, with Banfi Vintners back in 1978, quite frankly, as a secretary in the office. And John Mariani, who today is our chairman emeritus, and my mentor, Lucio Sare, who was born in Italy, came to the United States when he was 18. Um, they saw something in me. I fell in love with wine. They sent me to classes, uh, classes to become a sommelier. And I just fell in love with wine, but in particular with Italy, because it has such extraordinary history and culture. I just, uh, there, to me, there's, there's nothing like Italian wines. I, they are my favorite wine in the whole wide world. And quite frankly, the reason that I probably got my first job at Banffy back in 1978, I was telling the group earlier, uh, remember this, I was four when I started. <laughs> but back in 1978, I remember my appli the application that I filled out and it said, do you have any um, special characteristics that would make you good for this job? It was a secretarial job. I knew that Banffy, uh, was the importer of my favorite wine in the whole wide world, 
Rionetti Lambrusco. And I wrote, I wrote down that my favorite wine was Rionetti. It still is. And I got the job. I, I, <laughs> I, I really, um, I, I love it. And I've moved from into so many different positions, finally culminating my um, 42, going on 43 years on and off as VP of wine education. We were actually the first uh, wine importer to start an education team, to create an education team. So. That's great. Well, how often, did, well, notwithstanding COVID, how often do you get to, to travel to Italy and what's your favorite region or city in Italy? In well, well, definitely you're looking at Tuscany. <laughs> and I love Tuscany for me before COVID. I haven't been on a flight since March 12 <laughs> of 2020. I, I'm, I'm going crazy. But um, usually I would, I would be in Italy a couple of times a year and visiting the Castello, um, taking at Banfi over the years, um, we've made a commitment to take um, universities, hotel schools, uh, professors and students to Italy. So I would bring usually uh, one or two groups at least a year over to Italy on behalf of the Mariani family. So I, I love Tuscany. And then my sec second favorite place is where my favorite Lambrusco is born, and that's the stomach of Italy, Emilia Romagna. Okay, very, very good. So you, you keep referring to the the original creators of Banfi. Why don't you give us a history of how Banfi became a noted Italian winemaker? Yeah, it, it, we're we're really the new kids on the block when you think about it. Our company was established as an importer in 1919 by John Mariani Sr. Uh, John was born in Connecticut, but when he was very young, his father passed away and his mother returned home. Home for her wasn't anywhere here in the United States. Home for her was actually Italy. And she went to live there with her sister, Teo Delinda Banfi. Teo Delinda was head of the household for Cardinal Ratti of Milan. He became Pope Pius XI. So guess what? She bought all his food and wine. When young John Sr. decided to emigrate back to the United States, they say he took with him a small sum of money from his mom, but more importantly, all of his Aunt Teo Delinda's contacts in the wine world. And that's how, the, um, that's how we got a start. And we began importing wines into the US in 1919. Not a good year because that was the year prohibition started, but we made out. And then over the years, uh, John, uh, John Sr. Uh, brought his two sons, John Jr. and Harry into the business when they graduated from college. And those two brothers had a dream. And that dream was to not only import fine wines, but to produce wines. And they wanted to go back to their family's roots. And they did exactly that in 1978 when they bought the property that you see behind me. Um, and the rest is history. Then a year later, we bought property up in Piedmont in the northwestern corner of Italy. And this is where our heart and soul, and I feel as though I'm part of the family. This is where my heart and soul lies here in Tuscany, Piedmont. So you were telling us before, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy initial, <laughs> you weren't welcome with open arms, so to no, speak. No, you know, the, the challenge was that the Mariani brothers, and rightly so, were, were known as the marketers. We didn't own um, Rianetti Lambrusco, but we were known as the marketers of Rianetti. And when we bought this property in 1978, the people in the Montalcino area thought we were going to come in and try to change what Brunello was. They thought we were going to make a sweet, fizzy Brunello, so we weren't welcomed. Plus, there were only about 40 producers back in 1978. Today, we brought a renaissance to the area, according to Wine Spectator, because there are over 200 producers. But at the very beginning, they expected us to move forward and to change and make Brunello sweet. That has never been our intention. Our intentions have always been to take the traditions of the past, blend them with innovations of the present to make wines for today and the future. And, and that's been our philosophy. 
tell us that they've won numerous awards for their sustainability efforts. Can you can yeah. you comment on that and, and yeah. how they're how they're I, doing that? I remember when we went in in 1978, John Mariani Jr., who's our chairman emeritus, as I've mentioned, was gung ho on we you know it was going to be called sustainability, but using less SO2 in the production of wines, less pesticides, herbicides. He brought in people from all over Italy, but all over Europe and the world. He brought in winemakers from the University of Bordeaux, Geisenheim in Germany, University of California, Davis, Cornell University out of Ithaca. And he brought in these scientists and they said to us, if we want to make wines, because John's goal has always been to make the purest and most natural wines possible. They told us we would have to allow more land to be fallow so that mother nature could come in and bring in the good pests that eat the bad pests. And that's exactly what we did from the get-go before the word sustainability even existed. Our goal was to make wines as pure and natural as possible. That's wonderful. Now comes the the education part, and I think that's mm -hmm. why a lot of people have have tuned in, and and also me uh, to understand a little bit better the ex explain to us the the denomination of origin system and why it's so important for Italian wines. That I am that, so proud of you because nobody knows that it's a series of wine laws called the denomination of origin. Everybody calls it, oh, the DOC. DOC is one category. The denomination of origin wine laws, which are in Italy's wine laws, are the strictest wine laws in the world. They were created in 1963. And today what we have are four categories. I always look at them as, if you will, a pyramid. And what we have on the pyramid is the base tier, which is vino. It used to be called, it was formerly called vino da tavola, but we got rid of the da tavola of the table for obvious reasons, because you had wines that fell into that category that were extraordinary. They could be $200 a bottle and you had wines that were a buck a bottle. So we got rid of that da tavola, which is, is great. And it basically refers to wines that are red, white, and rosé. And more often than not, the Vino de Tavola wines are wines that are made with a blend of grapes that come from a number of different places, but all in Italy, all within the peninsula or the two largest islands in the Mediterranean, which are part of Italy, Sardinia and uh, Sicilia or Sicily. So um, what we have in the category right above that is a category called IGT. IGT is Italian, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. And what that is, is just a typical geographic indication. The government set forth rules and regulations for the production of wines in say a fairly large area. And what they do in Italy is they tell you not only what grapes you can plant in that area. For example, we're in Tuscany, we can't plant narrow davola because narrow davola is a southern grape. You find it in Sicily. So the rules are really extraordinary. In the IGT category, the Italian government also tells you what your yield per acre can be, the maximum, which is unbelievable. I can't imagine the US government going to a California producer and saying, you can't pull off 10 tons of grapes per acre. You've got to pull off eight tons or six tons or three tons. Guess what? We do that to our producers in Italy. Italian wines are extraordinary. When I look at the IGT category, I look at that as a fairly large category. It also is the category to which most of the orphans or the experimental wines belong to. The category of super Tuscans, which isn't a government designation. Super Veronese, Super Piemontese, or I shouldn't say Super Piemontese, leave that out. But um, they belong to this category of IGT wines. Then you've got a step up called DOC. DOC is Denominazione di Origine Controllata, patterned after France's Appellation Controllée. 
But again, the Italians took it a step further. Not only do we limit what grapes you can plant, do we also limit the yield. Yields for DOC wines are always lower than those for IGT wines. But guess what? We go and tell the producer how long they have to age those wines, and we even have the nerve to tell them what type of container. We may tell them you have to age your um, Sangiovese for one year, and at least uh, six months of that year have to be in wood. It's so amazing. And then we have the final rarefied category, DOCG, Denomination of Controlled and Guaranteed Origin. And, you know, some people say, oh, my God, DOCG, um, they're, they are the greatest wines in the world. But some people say, oh, they're the highest quality. No, no, no. No wine law, no government can guarantee quality. Quality is guaranteed by the producer. As we go up the pyramid and we get smaller and smaller and have less and less wines, what we have are more and more rules and regulations. So if you're a bad producer or you're starting off with bad grapes, even if you're a DOCG, you can't make great wines. But today we have 77 wines that carry that DOCG status. And it is extraordinary. Before DOCG wines can be sold to the consumer, the government actually demands samples of those wines to be tasted. And they just don't say, oh, Sharon, you got DOCG in 1980 for your Brunello that you get it forever. Every year we have to submit samples. And every year the government looks for the basic characteristics that should be found in that wine. Um, they have to be there. And if they're not, they tell you declassify the wine. And guess what? If you haven't declassified that wine on your own, you pay a penalty. Because when the government declassifies, they declassify down to vino. Now as a producer, I could declassify down to DOC. I could declassify down to Rosso di Montalcino, which is born in the same vineyards, the same area, but usually more vigorous vines. I could do that on my own. Or I could even declassify it into a super Tuscan in my area. But if I submit samples that I haven't declassified and I want to label that as Brunello and then declassified, you get pushed down to the bottom to vino. So it makes a, it, it makes a big difference. And one so, of the things to, I'm sorry, go ahead. So what was the, uh, the first wine to be a DOCG? Is that a, a my Brunello, question? my Brunello, I was there. It was announced on October 1st in the morning. Um, October 1st, 1980 was the first wine to achieve DOCG status. But I have to tell you in 19, 63, the DOCG category was established. It okay. took the Italian government 17 years to give out the first DOCG. That oh. was followed immediately after by Barolo and then Barbaresco. Okay. Uh, Justin, I, I think you have some questions from our audience. Yeah, absolutely. The audience is loving this. Um, <laughs> and we have, some, we have some very specific red wine questions. Sure. Um, and one of them is why, um, why do I feel the bite in the back of my throat when I drink red wine? Uh, because red wines have something called tannins. The tannins come from the skins. Um, if there are, are pits that are, uh, are the, when the grape skins, the pits, the, uh, the pulp, all of the, the skins especially, and the fact that sometimes red wines are not only aged, but at Banffy, we ferment a number of our red wines in wood. Um, you, you do get a, a little bit of that roughness. The other time, uh, there is also another reason for um, picking up an astringency. Um, sometimes it can appear as um, high alcohol in a wine. And that um, sometimes has uh, people saying, oh, you know, I feel a little bit of heat on the back of my mouth, or this wine is a little bit more intense, it's stronger, and it could also be due to alcohol. But typically speaking, red wines are fermented on the skins, white wines, the juice is traditionally taken off immediately from the skins. So you're not picking up as much in the 
way of tannins. Very interesting. Well, and to kind of build off the, that, our, um, our lodge in Cincinnati was wondering, when people drink the Italian red wines, what are some things they, sh they should consider? And do you have any tricks or tips for savoring it um, while you drink it? Yeah, um, well, one of the things to do, it depends on the wine. You know, we have wonderful wines, a simple Chianti in a flask um, is ready for bottling uh, within three months. One of my tips is that, you know, look at the, the style of the wine and the type of food that you're pairing with it because wine and food is a perfect marriage. And I always find um, Italian wines are challenging um, or a challenge to get really high scores. They're, they're extraordinary wines, they're great wines, but they're wines that have been built over thousands of years to go with food. And um, we should pair them with food. They aren't these big, powerful, over oaked um, uh, reds and, and whites that hit you over the head and they get a hundred point score. Typically speaking, Italian wines have an elegance and a stylishness. So it would start with Chianti and yes, yeah, spaghetti and meatballs, but guess what? Chianti, a simple Chianti is great with a hot dog or a, a burger on the barbecue. <laughs> then I would move on. And it depends on, you know, if you like red wines or white wines. My mentor, Lucio Sare used to say, White wine sets the stage for things to come. White wine is like kissing your brother or sister. Red <laughs> wine is like kissing your lover. So you now know why we make more red wines in Tuscany than we do white. But suffice it to say, we have wonderful whites as well. We have whites like Gavi that come from Piedmont. Gavi is made with a grape variety called Corteza that has a high vein of acidity. Guess what? It pairs very well with dishes that come from Piedmont, like banya cauda, that hot bath. You take fresh veggies, you dip them in a warm bath of olive oil with a little uh, garlic and anchovies, and it's fabulous. Then you can take wines like um, a Valpolicella or even a Ripasso that come from the Veneto, and you can pair those with a, with a panino, with a, with a sandwich with a salad, the ripasso is a little bit bigger and more powerful because it sits on the Amarone leaves and Amarone is an exciting red from Italy that's made with partially dried grapes to give it more richness and intensity. Then, you know, you could go on to um, our Brunello di Montalcino. Brunello is an extraordinary wine. I love Brunello um, with of course, Bisteca alla Fiorentina, but I also like it with a gorgonzola crusted uh, filet. Go down to Southern Italy, to Campania, and you have Taurasi. Taurasi is an extraordinary red, big and powerful that's been, uh, been made um, for centuries. And it's made with a grape variety called Alianico big, bold, and intense. I mean, if we had hours, I mean, literally, or days, <laughs> we could go on. We have thousands of different wines that are produced in Italy today. We have over 450 different varieties that we use in the production of Italian wines. Well, let me ask you this, Shan, since you, you, know, you mentioned the all-important aspect of Italian food. So you mentioned that your favorite wine is still you know, back in 78, it was Lambrusco. It's still Lambrusco. Yeah, I, what, is I, your, what is your favorite thing to pair that Lambrusco with? I, Lambrusco um, with a pepperoni pizza. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sitting on Sunday afternoon in front of the TV if you're watching a game <laughs> or something. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely fabulous. You know, wine doesn't have to give you visions of heaven. We have so many different wines in Italy. We have wines that fit every palate and fit every pocketbook. We have quaffable wines. Just so happens my uh, Rionetti Lambrusco, which by the way, Banffy, um, we don't import their, um, they, they sell it through um, Frederick uh, Wildman. Um, we were with Rionetti for many years. The, that style of Lambrusco is an Amabile style, off dry, sweet, but Italy, including Cantina Cooperativa Riunita, makes dry Lambruscos as well. So even within a category of wines, you can have different styles. We produce in Piedmont a dry Moscato called Bipop 
And we also produce a, um, a, a sweet version, Asti. So you can have everything. You can have wines that run the gamut um, from sweet to dry and everything in between. And that's one of the exciting things about Italy and, and her wines. It's also one of the challenging things to know exactly what you have in that bottle. It, this just means everyone has to just start drinking wines and continue that's drinking right. wines until they've tasted them all. And, and you know what? I, my friend Lucio used to say, um, it, tasting wine should be like going to a cocktail party <laughs> that, you know, you, you meet people that you don't know. Some people you may not like right off other people. Hey, you know, maybe you want to start a friendship with them or, um, whatever the case may be, but, um, it's, it's amazing what Italy has to offer. And I suggest just go out and try some simple wines, try two whites, two reds in different price points. You don't have to start at a $65 uh, Banfi, Casello Banfi Brunello di Montalcino. You can, you can try our Centenay for Every Day, which retails under $15 a bottle. And I know you're gonna find friends throughout the Italian wine world. We've got 20 regions and each of those 20 regions in Italy produces wine. I had uh, any more questions from the audience there, Justin? That's, that's it for now. We can we can let them. There was a lot of information coming in. I'm sure they'll start flying in with more questions here in a second. I, I have a question. Tell me the difference between a Chianti Classico and a Chianti Reserva. Oh, I all um, and this is also that's a really good point, Mark, because um, Chianti Classico, Classico, whenever you see that word on an Italian wine label, um, if it's a still wine, it always means that that is the original, the historic growing area where that wine was first born. So in Italy, we have Chianti and we have Chianti Classico, different rules and regulations for both of those wines. So Chianti Classico by law is a wine that has to be made with at least 80% Sangiovese. It has to age for a minimum of two years before it can be released. Whenever you see the Reserva on an Italian wine label, the government steps in and says, okay, we want additional aging for these wines. And I can't, as a producer, say, oh, I'm gonna make this wine a Reserva. I just mentioned my Centenay. I can't say, oh, I'm gonna hold it back for six months and I'm gonna call this six month older wine Centenay Reserva, no. Categories like Chianti. Chianti is divided into two categories. We've got Chianti, we have Chianti Superiore in that category, and we have Chianti Reserva. Chianti Reservas have to age for a minimum of 24 months before they're released. The um, Chianti Classico, I may have just misspoken. Chianti Classico is a separate category. Chianti Classico has to age for one year um, following the harvest. It can't be released until October 1st. Then within the Chianti Classico DOCG, we have rules for Chianti Classico Reserva. So Chianti Classico has to age for 12 months. Chianti Classico Reserva has to age for 24 months. And within the framework of Chianti Classico, there is a new designation that came about in 2013, and that is Gran Selezione. Those wines have to age a minimum of 30 months. And basically, what does all of this mean to us as consumers? It means, think about it. If a wine has to age for a year before it can be released, two years before it can be released, 30 months before it can be released, that wine is going to have power. It's going to be bigger and bolder than those non-aged uh, counterparts because you've got to start off with better grapes, grapes that have a lower yield or anything. Okay. Well... Uh, we're running out of time here, so how can we find out more about Banffy wines, including where they're sold? Uh, definitely, we have a, a fantastic website. It's um, banffywines.com. If you're looking for um, information on Costello Banffy, um, pictured in the background here, uh, that we have costellobanffy.it or uh, uh, .italy, .it. And um, we actually have a Borgo at the estate. It's uh, an amazing place. 
We've got 14 rooms. We were supposed to open next week, but we went to uh, red. Now we're back to orange. I talked to my colleagues this morning in Italy. We're back to orange, but our resort, our hospitality is probably not going to open for a month or so. At Sharon, least not you, until after Easter, because Italy is shut down for Easter. Do you guys host um, tours or um, can um, people we, do this in large we have, groups? Yes, people can um, go to uh, BanffyWines.com or CostelloBanffy.it and they can set up a tour and tasting. Um, you can also have dinner. We have a one-star Michelin restaurant on our property. We have an Enoteca, a tasting room, and a taverna. And it's really an exquisite place to visit. Before COVID, we were getting 70 to 100,000, um, 70,000 to 100,000 visitors a year. Obviously, it was much less last year. So. Yes. That's but, a, um, a I, I hope to get back there very soon. So do we all. Justin, <laughs> can you tell us if people are interested in joining uh, Sons and Daughters of Italy, how they could go about that, please? Absolutely. They can head to our website at... It's the leprechauns. Oh, it's the leprechauns today. www.osia.org and you can click on the member tab, find the nearest local lodge or sign up as an at-large member directly online. If you have any questions, you can email us at nationaloffice at osia.org. And then please follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. All right, well, Sharon, Again, okay. happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you for a wonderful informational, instructional uh, presentation oh. about Italian wines and your love of Italy. And we appreciate you being on. Next week, we're going to have Manja with Michelle. So we oh. will have the, the food aspect and we can discuss what wines to, do, to drink with which food. So again, our Facebook Live, Series continues next week, seven o'clock at the seven o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, again with Manja with Michelle. So that'll do it for tonight. Thank you all for watching. And Justin and Sharon, thank you. It was a great presentation. And well, uh, thank you very much. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, just reach out to me at Banffy Wines, um, S McCarthy at Banffy.com, at least through the 31st of March, and then I'm retiring. But I'm not going to retire. I'm going to continue to do um, seminars and tastings and events. So let me know if I can do a virtual for you guys. Or if you're in the Myrtle Beach area, I'd love to come in and do something down the road face-to-face -face on my favorite subject in the world, Italian wine.